Welcome again to the Kerlings Missionary Training Program, and this session we're going to be talking about how to approach people regarding the issue of the devil and Satan. And I'd like to just start with, uh, with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we ask for your wisdom and for your teaching so that we might better be able to instruct those that oppose themselves and to do that in humility and with a genuine desire to uphold you and your Son and your truth. Please, Father, guide us in our thoughts and in our reflections and help us to be truly the light of this world. Help us, Father, to do that better. And we ask for your blessing in that. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I'm not going to be talking in this session about Bible teaching about the devil and Satan, but rather how to approach people about these subjects. Now, the devil and Satan is uh, one of the most difficult areas to just start off talking to people about, and yet it is an area of huge interest. When I look at our websites and the statistics, there is far more interest in these subjects than in fact in any other. There's a lot of people on the internet and therefore in life generally searching for information about these subjects. Search terms like Lucifer, devil, Satan, sin, evil, temptation. The, uh, so many people searching for those terms every minute and come into our websites. So there's a lot of interest in this subject. Now, what of course we'd all like to be able to do is to have someone sitting in front of us with a lovely open mind and there we are showing them basic Bible teaching and they give us 10 minutes of their time and we explain to them uh, Bible teaching about this theme. But that's a luxury that you typically don't get. Because typically you're in a conversation with somebody in life and the issue comes up about devil and Satan and you say, well I believe that uh, uh, really, Satan just means an adversary, uh, and it it's, uh, refers at times to our sinfulness, to our, our sin uh, within us, um, <clears throat> or temptation within us, and other times it just refers to any, any adversary. But there is no, um, in, in that sense, devil that fell off the 99th floor back in the Garden of Eden. And, you know, they then will come back to us with their, with their views, and typically if you're talking to a Christian person, they will come out <clears throat> with ideas, uh, let's say Job 1, Isaiah 14, Revelation 12, uh, Ezekiel uh, about the, uh, the, the anointed cattle in the Garden of Eden. And straight away you tend to start off your conversation with these people talking about a difficult passage. And really <clears throat> that's unfortunately how typically the conversation goes, but we're starting off really on the back foot all the time, and that's, <clears throat> that's uh, not what we want to have. But what can you do? That's why I say that these are very difficult uh, subjects. And so I, I want to try to talk about how we can approach people about, uh, about the devil and Satan. Remember that most people who have either no belief or even a, a strong committed Christian belief, they have not really thought out their position whereas we have. Now just bear that in mind, that these people have not actually thought out <clears throat> their position. If you say to somebody, what do you think about the devil, even if they consider themselves a committed Christian, they often have no real thought out idea, whereas we have thought this thing through. And that's uh, in, an advantage in one sense. Now, I think it's good with this uh, whole topic to start off by saying, look, we're, I, I'm in a minority in what I think about this. The vast majority of people in this world over history and at this moment in time have believed and do believe in some kind of personal, cosmic, fallen angel type Satan. <clears throat> Most people do believe in this, but I don't. And to, to start off making that point, and to, to say a phrase I like to, to use is, look, even if I stand with my back to the world, even if my wife didn't agree with me, I would still hold to this view that I have because I honestly see it in the Bible. Now, there's something in that straight away that is attractive to some people, particularly those who are not maybe highly committed Christians. Because the idea of actually having a view that is a bit unusual, this is quite attractive to people. You know, man is never greater than, uh, than when he's in revolt. I, I, I think uh, Albert Camus said in the... Uh, 
the rebel. And so that is how it is. It's actually attractive, I think, to people that, hey, this is an idea, this is a way of belief that is most unusual. And that, that is uh, a good hook, I think, to, to start on with, with this subject. <clears throat> now, if you go to BibleBasicsOnline.com, you'll see on the left-hand side there a lot of Bible Basics PowerPoint presentations. And they're in English, and now we've got them coming in a number of languages. I find that a, a useful way to explain the gospel to people about any given doctrinal subject. Uh, if you're one-on-one -on -one to them, uh, with them and you've got a computer, and if you're in a position where you've got someone listening. But as I started off by saying, you really have that luxury. Because typically the issue comes up in conversation in the midst of just life, and it's very really hard to, to, to really you know, just sit someone down and say, well, give me 10 minutes of your time, sir, let me explain to you. It's not how life goes, is it, in, in practice. Now, I would like to uh, <clears throat> emphasize a danger in all this kind of thing of what I've called theological gladiatorship. It's not actually me that invented that phrase. It's a phrase I read uh, of John Thomas's soon before he died, where he said that one of his uh, regrets about his life was that he'd wasted too much time in what he called theological gladiatorship. And we've got to be very careful here, because to put it crudely, if you know what I mean, we are right and they are wrong. But once you're in that position, whereby you know you're right and you know he or she is in the wrong, you can start ego tripping. You can start using God's truth to fuel your own ego. I've done many things wrong in, in my life, but I look back uh, and I've been discussing these issues now coming up 30 years with, with people, which is a fairly long period of time. And in the first five or maybe 10 years, yeah, I was on an ego trip in all these discussions to win points. You know, I, I would argue with Jehovah's Witnesses and all kind of people who believed in the devil and Satan. And then I'd come to the meeting on Sunday morning and, how are you going, Duncan? Oh, yeah, I had the Jehovah's Witnesses round last night. I tied them up in knots. I quoted uh, James 1, that temptation comes from within. He didn't have an answer. But a guy did have an answer, actually. What I meant was he didn't have an answer that pleased me. Now, Straight away, this is exactly the sort of thing that God hates. God hates pride in all its forms, and particularly intellectual pride. Because frankly, who are we? As Job says, how little a portion is heard of God. We know so little in, term, in percentage terms of God. And the fact that we do have a better understanding than other people does not give us any reason to be proud. The other thing with this sort of gladiatorship, if you get in a situation where you quote one verse and the other guy quotes another verse, <clears throat> then you quote a verse and he quotes a verse, you both go out of the conversation absolutely even more convinced that you're right. Now, I'm sure you can remember conversations where you've had that experience, where you discuss this issue with the people, and at the end of it, you didn't convince the other guy, but you went out of the conversation more persuaded than ever that... I'm right. But remember, the same is probably happening for him or her. So actually, the whole thing can become quite counterproductive. Of course, we hope that we sowed some seeds of doubt in the other person's mind, and maybe we did. But in reality, you know, they go out of their conversations with us, and a lot of those people will go to their churches on Sunday morning and say, yeah, I met this fellow. You know what? He didn't even believe in the devil. I quoted Job 1 to him. He couldn't answer me. I quoted Revelation 12 to him. The guy didn't have a word to say. Well, that's not the case, but that's how they perceive it. So the whole thing can get very, very counterproductive very quickly, and I believe very displeasing to God. Now, that's not to say that we are not to discuss the topic or, or the verses with people. I'm talking about our motivation and our whole approach to, to this. Now, to try to avoid this, you know how annoying it is when, let's say, you quote Mark 7, which says that sin comes from within, all these evil thoughts and all kind of sin come from within, out of the heart of man, there's nothing that can uh, get into a man from outside him and defile him, it all comes from uh, within the human heart. 
you imagine you quote that verse to someone who believes in the devil and you sort of politely say, well, you know, what do you make of it? And the guy says, ah, oh, what do I make of that? Well, look, uh, Job 1, there was Satan on the earth in Job 1. Revelation 12, the devil got thrown out of heaven. And you think, look, no, you're not answering what I said. I quoted you from Mark 7 that sin comes from within, and you start talking to me about Job and Revelation 12. On that, from our point of view, we've got to try and keep people back on the context. Even if you end up saying, Job, Revelation 12, I don't really know what they mean. Don't be ashamed to say that. You're, if you're going to persuade anyone, I suggest that you will get further with them by showing the humility to say about a passage, I don't know, or I'm not sure what that means. That's my favorite little phrase. Not to say, I don't know, but to say, I've read that many times, you know, but I'm not sure what it means. But don't allow people to take you away from the passage you've quoted. Now remember the other way as well. If they quote to you Job 1, look, there was Satan on the earth in, in Job chapter 1, and he smote Job with, uh, with boils and, and all this. If you then answer that passage which they've quoted by saying, ah oh, yeah, but in Mark 7 it says that sin comes from within. Put yourselves in the shoes of that person who believes in the devil or Satan. They're going to think, oh, look, I quoted a Bible passage to the guy and he quoted another one that was irrelevant. Now just remember that that's what goes on in people's minds. Realize that a lot of the feelings that you have of frustration and irritation with someone who believes differently to you is actually also what they have with you. So if a guy quotes Job 1, then talk about Job 1 and talk about Job and then start talking about something else. Now, I've put uh, there on the slide the build flash moments. What do I mean by that? In conversation, in dialogue, uh, on any level, there can be at times flash moments where you say something that the other person agrees with or they say something that exactly what you think. And in those moments, you catch each other's eye. You may even touch each other. You might even shake hands in some cultures, in that flash moment. If you can build as many of them as possible. Now, how do you do this? Well, let's take an example from, from, from the issue of the devil and Satan. I suggest that well, we know there's difficult passages. Okay, There's Job, there's, there's Isaiah 14 about Lucifer, etc. If you can... Go to those passages before they do. I'll say that again. Go to the difficult passages before they do. Because in that way, the dialogue develops much better. So let's say there you are, you're in conversation about Satan or the devil, and you've said your piece about uh, what you think the word Satan means, and etc. Et and then say, because the other guy is going to say, but Lucifer fell from heaven. But Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. But the devil got thrown out of heaven in Revelation 12. They're going to say that. I mean, I'm talking about approaching committed Christians now. Uh, people are going to quote that. And you know they're going to quote it. So get there before they do. So, building a flash moment. Let's say you, you've just had your conversation. Maybe you've been going five minutes. You've explained basically your view and they've uh, said their view, and then to say to someone, you remember about Lucifer, that Lucifer got thrown out of heaven in Isaiah 14, and you've got to flat, and catch their eye, yeah, 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 that, that's right, that's right, that's right, Lucifer got thrown out of heaven in Isaiah 14, and, and straight away you've got that touching, that touche, that, that, that flash between you, where you've said something that they agree with, you remember Isaiah 14? Lucifer got thrown out of heaven, right? Yes, you're right. And then, of course, you can, you can go and make your point. But, and you know what? The word Satan, as far as I know, and I like to use that kind of phrase so it's not too threatening, the word Satan, as far as I remember, as far as I recall, doesn't occur in Isaiah. Certainly not in Isaiah 14. Yeah. And... Uh, as, I, as far as I remember, 
Isn't the context starting off there talking about a human king, a king of Babylon? So then, try to build those flash moments. And I suggest in, in these kind of conversations, they can very easily unlovely themselves and become rather aggressive, and that's not what you want. Um, try to go to the difficult passages before they do. In this whole thing, we're in the business of paradigm shifting. And what I mean by that, what is a paradigm? Paradigm is like a world view. It's a way of looking at life. Let's take a simple example. There was a paradigm that the, the earth was flat. And if you sail to the edge too far, you fell off the edge. And, of course, from a human point of view, without you know, too much science, well, that is what it seems. Because you look at the earth and it seems to the naked eye, it seems pretty flat. A few mountains, but it's flat. And you look at the sea, and, well, yeah, I mean, it, it looks like it just goes on and then it stops. So, you know, people were in a paradigm of thinking the earth was flat. You can't blame them for that. They thought the earth was flat. And when you know, Galileo and other guys said, you know what, it's round, there was a huge anger, a huge anger, with, with those people who said, no, the earth's not flat, it's round. And you're crazy, you're mentally disturbed. How can you say the earth's not flat? Of course, just look out there to see, man, can't you see? And then Columbus sailed to the end of the ocean and he found America. And then, you know, science developed, Copernicus and Galileo, etc. It became obvious they were saying, saying the right thing, and yeah, sure. Now, the paradigm shifted the other way. It's obvious the Earth is round, and if you say, in all seriousness, the Earth is flat, you'd probably get locked up for 20 years in a mental institution. So then, that's, uh, that's an example of a paradigm shift. Now, when people believe, as uh, many of you at one stage did believe, in the devil as a personal cosmic kind of be being, that's a worldview, it's a way of thinking. And if somebody comes and says, no, no, you got it all wrong, you're gonna, there's going to be an element of anger. That's a feature of a paradigm being challenged. Anger. And to get someone to totally, totally rethink it and come to, you know, like a view that the earth is not flat, it's round. Yeah, this is a big thing. And it tends to happen, the, the, it tends to happen not so uh, slowly. Subconsciously it happens slowly. But then there tends to be a, a sort of a waterfall, a sort of a trigger where, okay, yeah, now I change. But subconsciously, of course, it's been changing slowly. So don't expect immediate victory in this. Uh, that it's an acquired taste, if you like. It's a bit like the first time I drank tonic. I thought it was horrible. But now I, I thought, how could anyone drink this bitter, this bitter drink? Uh, and now I, I like it. But it's an acquired taste. And so I think it is with, uh, with shifting paradigms, with shifting this whole world view about Satan uh, and the devil. So just, uh, just bear that in mind. I think you know, the devil is really one of the hardest issues to, to start with, and yet because it's the sort of issue that tends to come up quite often, uh, it, it can often be our first point of discussion with a person, and it's not the best. It's easier, I think, to shift someone on something like hell is the grave. Uh, that's, hell is a good subject, because it's actually what we prefer to believe, that hell is the grave, not a place of eternal fire. It's pretty easy to prove that from the Bible, and there's a lot of people in standard Christianity who share our view on that anyway, these days. Uh, once you can shift someone on a smaller thing, then they start to doubt whether my whole theology, whether my whole world view is correct after all. But it's easier to shift something on a, somebody on a smaller thing than jump in with a devil, which is probably one of the hardest things to make the shift on. Now, of course, we are dealing with different types of people. And I've put three categories up there, which I think are about it. There's what I call the curious, or the unbeliever. The person who is not a Christian. And then there are cultural Christians. That is, people who will say, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a Catholic, I'm Orthodox, or whatever. But they, they actually don't know the Bible, they don't study. Uh, they're not that aware, they're not that switched on. And then there's committed Christians who know the Bible, who will give you a, a run for your money. Now... 
in conversation with people, you may have only seconds or half a second to decide who exactly you're dealing with. But I think they roughly fall into those three categories. And the approach to each of them, I suggest, is different. Let's start off with the, what I call the curious, the unbelieving, that is, the non-Christians. Give them positive Bible teaching. Now, when people say, oh, yeah, what do you believe in your church? It's very easy to say, well, we don't believe in the devil. We don't believe in the Trinity. It's very negative. Uh, particularly with this idea of, of the devil, you can start off really quite, uh, quite positive by saying, well, oh, about Satan, I've got a really unusual view about that. And stop for half a second. Because you know what the question's going to be. Oh, and what's that? It's dialogue building. This is the art, and it is an art, of conversation. And yet, I think that, you know, you can say what we believe about the devil and Satan, but I think it's, having made a positive point, it's worth pointing out the error of popular views, because it is a lot of those popular views that actually stop people believing, that turn people off Christianity. And I think you need to point that out. And I've said consider taking a historical approach. By that, I mean with the devil, starting off by saying, look, Judaism, uh, you know, God's people in the Old Testament initially did not believe in Satan or the devil. Then they went into captivity in Babylon, and they picked up this idea of dualism, that there's a good God uh, and a God of evil, who's, uh, you know, Satan. And then it developed and developed. The early church fathers were influenced by this, and then there were the... Uh, the witch hunts in the, in the Middle Ages, when anyone who looked like they had demons was killed and persecuted. And then explain to these people the practical meaning for you. And we'll come on to what the practical meaning for us of the, our understanding of the devil might be a bit later. Now, then there's these cultural Christians. These people will say, yeah, I'm a Christian, when actually they don't know much and maybe they've not really committed themselves. I think you can make some allusion to the common errors, but a bit more gentle than you would when you're talking to unbelievers. Be fairly specific about what the Bible actually says. I think when you're talking to unbelievers, there's no point saying, do you know what, in Mark chapter 7 verse 15, it says that all sin comes from within. I asked, Mark 7 what? What's Mark 7? Oh, Mark chapter 7 verse 15. I'm going to say that to a guy who's never opened the Bible in his life pretty well. I mean... Whereas with cultural Christians, yeah, you can. You, you can make some f fairly specific biblical references, and again, the practical meaning for you. Now, it's far harder, of course, with committed Christians. People are going to start trading verses with you. you know, these people are the hardest, quite honestly. They're the hardest people to convert. Um, and an awful lot of our preaching as a community traditionally has been directed at those kinds of people. And actually, you're taking a bite of the hardest apple. It's far easier to, to, to go to, uh, uh, let's say, a, a former communist country where, where people maybe don't have much understanding about God or the Bible, um, where they're, they're like a clean, a clean sheet of paper, really, in, in many ways. Or, or maybe to Muslims, even. Uh, committed Christians who know the Bible are some of the hardest people to shift. And as I say, a lot of our preaching literature... Uh, amongst us as you know, non-Trinitarians, people who don't believe in the devil, etc. A lot of our stuff is focused at that audience. When in fact, as I say, they're the hardest, they're the hardest lot to, to crack. Now, you don't want to get into a position where you dogmatically state your point, and they're going to dogmatically state theirs. You're going to end up in a fight, and no one's going to win. I suggest we take the approach with them of, I've got a problem understanding your position. Can you help me? Uh, you know, I mean that. I'm crying out loud. I would love to be able to be a mainstream Christian. But I can't be because I, to put it politely, I don't get about everything that they believe about theology. But sure, it would be great if I could. You know? But you have lots more friends than the rest of it. So, yeah, it's not quite tongue-in-cheek. There's an element of sincerity in this. When I, I would say to them, look, I've got a real problem understanding this idea of um, yeah, uh, that, that Lucifer was an angel. I've got a real problem with this. 
and use some adjectives, not simply boldly and boldly stating, I don't understand, however you can believe that uh, Lucifer refers to Satan, when, do you know the word Satan doesn't occur in Isaiah 14? Do you know the word Satan does not occur in Genesis? You're straight out the way, you're setting yourself up for, for, for conflict. And if you win that conflict, and the guy humbles himself and says, oh, you're right, you know what? The guy will go on in his spiritual life being as confrontational and aggressive and arrogant as you were. So, I would put it another way. Look, I don't understand how in Isaiah 14 you think it's talking about Satan because I honestly, I genuinely, I have considerable difficulty, I sincerely, I really have a problem with the fact that I, I don't see the word Satan anywhere in Isaiah 14. And again, show the meaning in practice of our understanding. Now that's important because, quite frankly, why does doctrine matter? What's important? Because it affects our lives. And in this issue of how to get people to see that doctrine matters, that actually does matter what you believe about Satan, I ultimately can think of no other argument than because it affects our lives. Now I suggest in talking with these committed Christians, as I said in a previous, in the first study, in fact, about our motivations, that we should show some humility. Show your knowledge of the Bible in a humble way. You could argue the other way and say, oh no, if you impress them that you really know your chapters and verses, they'll be impressed. Now you could use that argument, I prefer to go the other way and say, if you show humility, and if you are humble, genuinely, not putting it on, um, that's a far more persuasive thing. I think with, with the devil and Satan, I really think you can honestly say to people, look, this is a difficult subject, and I don't have the answer to my own satisfaction for every single verse that mentions Satan and the devil. And that's true. I don't have, I, I can tell you what I think it doesn't mean, and I can suggest to you what I think it does mean. But I can't say that with every one of those verses that mentions Satan and the devil, I am completely 100% convicted that I positively do know what it means. I'm pretty sure I know what it doesn't mean, but I think it's no harm to say that. So instead of uh, saying uh, John 14, 28, for example, in the context of uh, Jesus not being God, John 14, 28 says, my father's greater than I. How'd you answer that, buddy? There's a verse in John somewhere Chapter 14, I think, somewhere at the end of the chapter, that says, my father is greater than I. Now, I've said with uh, committed Christians, go to the difficult passages before they do. And we talked about having a flash moment over Isaiah 14. Well, you remember in Isaiah, I think it's around chapter 14, you remember how Lucifer uh, is thrown out of heaven. Yes, they catch your eye absolutely. You've got your flash moment. Now, there are two things that you can really emphasize about um, the, our approach to the devil, and that is that the Bible teaches that sin comes from within, and that the essence of Christianity is to be spiritually minded. And the other thing is that God is almighty, and if God is really almighty, there's no space for a devil. There's no place for Satan if God's almighty. I think with committed Christians that they will agree those two points, that God is definitely almighty, that he has 100% of the power, and that sin does come from within, and we must take responsibility for human sin. Most people who believe in the devil will agree that far. So I, I think those two strands, that sin comes from within and we must take the total responsibility for our sin, we can't just say, hey, Satan made me do it, and that God is almighty, Absolutely, 100% power is with God. For me, those uh, two approaches are good to start with, with committed Christians about the devil, because they will normally accept that. Now, of course, in our opinion, if you accept that, well, you better just jettison your, your orthodox view of Satan, because it doesn't fit. Now, you can, possibly, with committed Christians, mention some pretty crazy statements that have been made by the church fathers about Satan. For example, Irenaeus said that Satan was thrown out 
at the time of Genesis 3, but then his angels got thrown out in Genesis 6 when we read about the sons of God married the daughters of men. Oh, wait a minute. So wait a minute. Did they also sin? Uh, but did they sin a bit later? Did they do a different sin to what Satan did? Uh, Tertullian is really pretty wacky. It said that when they were thrown out, they had to travel through the air to get from heaven to earth, and that's why the devil and his angels have got wings. You see that in the orthodox pictures of Lucifer, that he's got wings. Lactantius, Christ and Lucifer were both originally angels. They had the same nature, but Lucifer fell because he was jealous of Jesus as his older brother. Uh, Athanasius are on about uh, Jesus had to cleanse the air. Uh, and when you sneeze and people say, bless you, that apparently was started by Athanasius, who also fixed up the uh, idea of the Trinity, just for good measure, um, because of his idea that... Um, Demons are so small that when you take a, a deep breath, there's demons coming inside you. When you chew that, you can get demons coming inside you. So you better say to the guy, oh, bless you. Like, I, I hold the demons off you. Augustine, city of God, God shall do only good. Oh, man. I mean, the Bible is pretty clear about the creation of evil by God and that evil comes from the Lord. Evil is nothing. Augustine said, since God makes everything that is and God didn't make evil. Now, this is just my approach. You can take this approach or not. Because most thinking Christians would say, oh, whoa, wait a minute, you know, I don't quite go along with that. Um, and then hard questions. Again, putting them in humility, saying, look, you know, I've honestly got a question. That I don't understand. I can't get my brain around this bit. Now, you say that the devil was thrown out of heaven. Um, I have a problem understanding the chronology here. So when was the devil thrown out of heaven? Before creation? Before Adam was created? Or after Adam was created? But Revelation 12 talks about the devil being thrown out of heaven sometime after the time of Jesus. Isaiah 14 talks about a fall from heaven of Lucifer. In Isaiah's time, Jesus says during his ministry, I saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning when the disciples went out and did miracles. And, you know, was it at the time of Genesis 6 when the sons of God saw the daughters of men? Does that, you know, that's classically interpreted as meaning that the angels came down to earth then. So when, when, did, when did this fall happen? Now, it's, I think, putting that together, it's clear that the Satan in all these places does not refer to one and the same being. And I think the chronological difficulty is a pretty strong difficulty for people who believe in Satan. But as I started by saying, they haven't thought out their position. They really haven't. And all you can do, I think, is to put these issues to people who believe in the devil. But... I think, as I said, that, that that's only one group of people you're talking to. You may be talking to unbelievers, where, again, you can get a flash moment. You can say, look, you know, i got a real problem with how most of the world seems to believe, or most of the Christian world seems to believe about the devil and Satan, because, dirty dirt, this chronological problem. And then you'll get a flash moment. An unbeliever will say, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. I understand your problem. I, yeah, yeah, I got that problem. What's their answer? I, I don't know. That's where coming up with the, the negative problem, that the, problem of, the problems of the orthodox position is not necessarily negative in itself, particularly to unbelievers who don't believe anyway in Christ at this time. Other questions, if the devil fell, what was the nature of his fall? What exactly did he do wrong? So if he got uh, thrown out, well, where did he land? And that's not a silly question, because, I mean, there's... All sorts of craters, of course, on the Earth's surface. And particularly in Western Europe and in England, there's places like the Devil's Punch Bowl, just south of London. And people honestly saw these uh, depressions on the Earth's surface and tended to think, oh, that's where Lucifer landed. Uh, and that's why they're still called, you know, the Devil's Punch Bowl. It's just south of, south of London. And there's other places like that in Western England, and I'm sure all over Europe. So it's a fair question. And where did he land in the Garden of Eden? 
would we sin if the devil didn't exist? If not, then it seems a bit unfair that we should be punished for our sins. The devil should be gotten hold of and punished, not me. Can the devil ever repent? A lot of people simplistically say, oh yeah, it was John Milton in Paradise Lost that created all these images about the devil and all that. I would argue that actually he's actually being sarcastic about the orthodox view of Satan. Uh, in my book, The Real Devil, you can uh, see quite a few, uh, there's a whole section in there about this issue of Milton and Paradise Lost. So he observes there, man therefore shall find grace. The other, he means Satan, none. His point is, it's pretty bizarre. Adam could sin and repent. Satan sinned and no, he can't repent. Why? How can the positive spiritual effect of Satan be explained? 1 Timothy 1.20, men were delivered to Satan so they might learn not to blaspheme. If you're delivered to Satan, this is for the destruction of the flesh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5. And the flesh in Paul's writings is normally talking about our, our fleshly behavior. He's saying that can be destroyed by Satan. And then this whole idea of fallen angels being thrown out of heaven, they come down to earth where they run around tempting human beings to sin and making all kind of trouble on the earth. Now wait a minute. If they were thrown down by God to earth in punishment for their sin, why should humanity suffer because of that? Isn't that rather like punishing a psychopath by giving him a loaded gun and throwing him out of the courtroom into a playground with a load of kids in it? That's the same logic. What exactly is our defense against the devil? Now, Orthodox churches would have the idea that if you uh, touch uh, a cross or an icon or you recite a certain charm, if you get baptized, the Protestants would say, if you utter the name of Jesus, if you read your Bible, the devil gets scared and he runs away. Really? What, what, why? Why would he get scared? Yeah, all these questions are, keep on demanding to be pushed a stage further back. The other thing is that if Satan has got all this power, if Satan is, as people say, the god of this world, if he's the king of the cosmos at this moment, and he's responsible for the temptation process in every single human being on the face of this planet, all seven billion of us, 24-7, he's got huge power. And I forget how big the cosmos is. There's the earth with the different planets around it, and because we live on the Earth, we tend to think, wow, the Earth is huge. Earth is nothing compared, let's say, to Saturn. The Earth is absolutely tiny compared to the Sun. And our Sun is absolutely tiny compared to Arcturus. And Arcturus is absolutely tiny compared to Antares. And so we go on. The cosmos is huge. Are you really telling me that this Satan guy has got, let's say, the whole power in this place? Or at least 50% of the power? Because the obvious question that is begged is well, where did he get it from? He got it from God. But I thought he'd been naughty. I thought he'd been chucked out. You mean God gave him all this power? Or that he grabbed something, you know, 50% of it off God and God couldn't control it? Yeah, th this whole idea of an orthodox devil and Satan, it, it just creates too many problems. And these are the sort of things you can share with, with people. That from the point of view of, yeah, this is my problem, with the common idea, that's why I have the idea that I have. Now, I said that with all people that we discuss this issue with, the practical meaning of it for me must be stressed. Here in the, this uh, hall where we're having the, the, this conference, there have been people who have sat with me who have been alcoholics and drug addicts, and we have spoken about sin and temptation and the nature of it, and I have discussed with them our understanding of Satan, that the real Satan is you that you are not a puppet of some cosmic power that is way stronger than you, 
The essence of Christianity is a battle within you, within the human mind. And the real adversary is your own fountain of temptation within your own mind. And there are people who have sat through and chatted through who are now clean of drugs and are not alcoholic anymore. Now, the whole essence of Christianity is to be spiritually minded, and you know, most committed Christians would, I guess, say amen to that. The other thing about our understanding of sin, that it comes from within, and that we die because of our sin, uh, because it's just that we die, and it's not so that Satan has to be gotten hold of and punished, uh, because we're responsible for our sins, it means that we don't minimize sin, neither our own nor other people's. There's a quote from uh, Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag Archipelago. If only it were all so simple. If only it were necessary only to separate evil people from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? Now, you know, I, I'm only sharing with you how I talk to people. And I talk to people in the Russian-speaking world who would be aware of Solzhenitsyn and Gulag, his, uh, his novel. Um, you have to find your own way. And I'm not suggesting you memorize that quote, but you, you could, you know, sum it up and say, oh, yeah, there's uh, Solzhenitsyn in Gulag Archipelago. He talks about that, that it's not so simple as to just put the evil people off in a, in, in a concentration camp, but, but the line that divides good and evil runs right through the heart of every one of us. You can talk about maybe experience of life, like, oh, you know, there was a court case where some guy was up for murder or rape or something. You know what? In all seriousness, he said, the devil made me do it. I'm innocent. Don't put me in jail. What do you think of that? And, you know, people would have to say, ah, yeah, no, he should go to jail. Or say, you know, there's a book I heard of called Bad Men Do What Good Men Dream Of. Um, uh, and I say, look, we, we have every one of us within us desires which are disgusting, do we not? Do we not all have desires that we would be terribly embarrassed if, if we had to uh, publicly share them with other people? And I say, look, yeah, that's what we're like. And then you can talk to people about demonizing people. But no, we take responsibility for our sin, and when we see people committing sin, we Face that for what it is. It's not that the devil made them do it. They sinned. And when we sin, it's not because the devil made me do it. We sin. And therefore, you don't demonize other people. And demonizing people is very common. And you see this in cartoons. That's a cartoon from uh, the Cold War period in, in America, uh, where the Soviet Union is... Uh, drawn there as a dragon with lots of horns on that's gobbling people up. And Lenin there presented with the horns on. This is typical of how people think. Just draw horns on a person, turn him into the devil. There's a great desire to demonize people, to externalize sin. It's not me, it's the others. How many times have we felt that or said that? How are you? <laughs> I'm fine, it's the others. That's the whole basis of this drawing horns on another person. And incidentally, the Russians did it as well. They who, who were supposedly communists not believing in God. Still, draw horns on the, uh, the Germans in, in that case. Turn them into a devil figure. And of course, Germany was demonized in cartoons as a, a devil beast kind of figure and the Germans, you know, the Nazis, let us say, not the German people, but uh, the, the Nazis uh, demonized Jewish people. You see that cartoon of a, a Jewish guy uh, made to appear dark and with big features like the devil. It's going on right now. Muslims demonize the West, drawing horns on the head of pictures of British and American presidents. And Christians, in, you know, in, in the inverted commas, in, uh, in Bosnia, did the same to Muslims. This is a Bosnian 
a Bosnian Serb cartoon uh, mocking the uh, mocking uh, Muhammad, putting horns on his head, uh, etc. So everyone does this to each other. They draw horns on the other guy because we so want to externalize sin. So how do we approach people about the devil? Well, I've said that I suggest we start with the idea that God is almighty. And if God is really almighty, 100% power, there's no room for the devil. And you can mention that that passage in Isaiah 45, 5-7, where God says, I create the light, I create the darkness, I make peace, I create evil, in the sense of disaster, the good and the evil or the disaster comes from God. You can say, look, this was in the context of Judah being 70 years in Babylon and picking up the Babylonian ideas of uh, dualism, that there's a good God and an evil God. And the good God gives you all the candies and all the nice things, and the evil God gives you, you know, disasters and problems and illness and the rest of it. And that God is saying in Isaiah 45, against that background, that's not right. And then to move on, that sin comes from within, and Mark 7, I think, is the best passage, and back it up with James 1. And generally, most people from experience will agree with that. Even an atheist would probably agree with that, that the process of sin and temptation comes from within. So you're on fairly solid ground with most people on those two points. Bearing in mind that there's very few real atheists these days. Most people will accept there is some kind of a God in some form. Um, and if God is God, and Almighty and the Creator, there's no space actually for the Satan figure. So having uh, got agreement on that point, that sin comes from within, you then say, so you know, our internal temptation, we ourselves, we're our own worst enemy. I like to use that phrase. We're our own worst enemy, aren't we? Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm my own worst enemy. People will agree with that. Then you say, well, you know, the word Satan basically means an enemy or an adversary. So we are our own worst Satan. So would you accept, or, you know, effectively, that Satan, you know, it could just be a, a way of personifying we ourselves, our own dysfunction, our own weakness. And then say, you know, but not every time. The word Satan, it just, it just means an adversary. You can quote... Peter, as, a, as a, uh, a Satan, God, 2 Samuel 24, compared to 1 Chronicles 21, that God is spoken of as a Satan, that the word, as a word, simply means an adversary. It's just been freighted, it's been loaded with negative connotations in, in European culture. And Judas, described as, you know, a devil, a false accuser, and so forth. Just one uh, note, I often hear it said in our uh, preaching of the gospel. Oh, we believe that Satan refers to sin. We believe that Satan doesn't exist. It refers to uh, our own nature. It refers to uh, our own temptations. That's not right. And if you say that, anyone who knows the Bible will, will really catch you out on that because you say, okay, let's go to Job 1. Let's go to Matthew 16 where Peter is called a Satan. Are you telling me that that Satan there is human nature? And it's not. Clearly not. When uh, God was a Satan to David, well, God is human nature, you can't go through the Bible looking at every reference to the word Satan and devil and say this refers to human nature, because it doesn't. So be a little bit careful with that, that Satan and the devil are words which mean an enemy, uh, an adversary, a false accuser, they normally just refer to people and ideas and uh, empires uh, and, and world systems at times, or organizations, the synagogue of Satan. And sometimes, but not always, sometimes the idea is used figuratively to describe the real problem that we have of we ourselves, our own sinfulness. Now, having made that presentation, maybe you can do it in five or ten minutes, and it's, it's difficult It's difficult to get people to give you five or ten minutes of their undivided attention. But that's the aim, I think, in conversation. And then they're probably going to come up with objections. 
even people who are nominal Christians will have got some idea about didn't Satan fall out of heaven in the Garden of Eden? And as I say, it is no shame in, in admitting if they ask a question you can't answer to say, look, I, I'm not sure what that means. There's no shame in that. And of course, try to get their contact details and get back to them later on. And say, you know, if you can, get their email and say, look, you know, I thought about your question and here's my take on it. I, I couldn't answer it at the time. You know, that's a very unusual and I think a very persuasive way to preach the gospel. Now, I've said, answer the actual passage. Don't do what a lot of people do to us, where you quote a verse and they just go right off and quote another verse that doesn't answer what you've quoted. And try to answer the passage that they've quoted within its context. So they quote Job 1. So, okay, now let's, let's look. Actually, Job 2, just the next chapter, verse 10, Job says, Shall we not receive good from the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And you can go on. Have pity upon me, my friends, the hand of God has touched me. Job 19, 21. And then say, look, at the end of it, end of the book, there's no Satan there. And the friends came, and everyone came to Job and comforted him over all the evil that God had brought upon him. So then, it seems to me that... We have in this subject, I think, the most challenging, the most challenging of all doctrinal areas, and yet, in a, in a sense, the most important. Because we're not preaching in order to just persuade people that I'm right and you are wrong. We're not trying to win points. We're trying, in the end, to bring about the glory of God. We're trying to bring people to the essence of Christianity, to bring people to Jesus. And life in Christ means to be spiritually minded. That is the essence of Christianity, how we think, who we are as persons, our acceptance of the hand of God in our lives, bringing evil, you know, in the sense of problems, etc., um, overcoming temptation that arises within our minds. This is the essence of Christianity, and this is where this subject is so important, and where so many people have said and testified that their lives have been transformed by a correct understanding of this point. So all the way through, in dealing with people, with any doctrinal subject, but I think particularly with this, this is a gift in terms of being able to say this makes a huge practical difference. Now, I've shared with you my approach, and it's only my approach. Um, I've mentioned that you could... Uh, find some quotes of crazy things that uh, the Christian leaders have said about the devil, which is clearly nonsense. Um, there's a whole uh, list of hard questions about the devil that uh, we can ask people. And I'm not pushing this book because I wrote it, but this is my reflection from uh, 30 years of discussing the devil issue. And it's online and in, in different languages. Here you've got suggested explanations of all the passages that talk about Satan or the devil. You've got historical outline of how the thing, the idea developed. Uh, you've got plenty of uh, opportunity to see the, the wrong ideas that are pushed by, by, by theologians, let's say, who believe in, in the devil. Um, and there's a chapter there all about the hard questions. That's just ideas for you. To, if it's helpful to you, because each of us must find our own preaching style. I've simply shared with you my approach. Um, but the main thing, as I see it with this subject, is its colossal practical meaning. So we really can pray that God will empower us and strengthen us to bring more and more people to the great freedom in practice which this whole uh, true understanding of the devil and Satan has already brought to so very many. Thank you.